everybody. My name is Nicole Kraft, and I am so excited to welcome you. Um, this is the Sports and Society Huddles. We meet every Thursday, and we talk with people who are in some way involved in sports, maybe not right this second, because, of course, sports are a little bit on hiatus. But we want to um, be able to keep sports in our lives, because we all know how important that is to us. The goal of the Sports and Society Initiative is to create dialogue and space for that dialogue and have events and do research and uh, stimulate career opportunities for students and the public as it relates to sports and where it intersects with society. And today we have a very, very special group that we've gathered together who are going to talk with us about an opportunity and a lifestyle that I don't think too many of us really understand. But they have been some of the most popular players in Ohio State basketball, um, and I'm just thrilled to welcome them. But before we get to that, I want to give you some housekeeping measures. One, um, it, we're going to be um, able to talk uh, and we're going to answer as many of your questions as we can. The way you're going to submit those questions is with the Q and a at the bottom so please just send us the question you'll also have the opportunity to upvote questions so if somebody asks your question just give us a little thumbs up and that'll rise to the top of our pile um, the chat function is off so if there's any uh, thing that you need to tell me just put it in the question and I will see them all um, this is being recorded so if you stay on this call just uh, know that that's going to be part of the recording we'll post that afterwards we really want your questions though to drive this conversation so please ask them and uh, you know we'd love to hear what you're thinking and, and what you've always wondered about the life of being a walk-on. So I am thrilled to introduce uh, three of the, I swear you guys, you have been the most popular players. I mean, jo Joey, I feel like every picture I ever see of you, you got your arms raised and everybody's cheering. Um, we have Joey Lane, Danny Hummer, and Mark Titus, and I hope you guys will join me in welcoming them. If we could all be applauding, we would be. Um, but so first of all, could you guys tell us where you are? And, and I also want to introduce you to my very good friend, Colin Ganand, who's here with us to help navigate your questions. Uh, he is my teaching assistant and also the president of Scarlet and Gray Sports Radio. So I think he hopes to follow your footsteps, Mark, and uh, have a pretty successful career in broadcasting. Um, so tell me, uh, maybe you could start. Joey, tell us where you are and, and what you've been up to since you left uh, Columbus. Yeah, so uh, right now I'm in uh, Chicago, Illinois, back home. Um, at the parents' house. First time that my family of four has been together, um, living under one roof in like five years. So um, it's been fun to have me and my sister, my parents all together, annoying each other, um, which has been a blast. Uh, since I kind of left school, um, I became the knockoff Mark Titus and started my own podcast um, while I was uh, also an intern at Nike. So um, doing those together was a lot of fun. Uh, when that internship ended, um, I kept going with the podcast, which was a blast, interviewing all types of uh, different people, Ohio State and beyond. I'm still doing that um, as much as I can, but I've also uh, started a full-time job where I was supposed to be back in Columbus, but um, been working remotely from home and, and having a blast doing that as well. So um, I miss basketball. I miss Ohio State, but I still still get my taste of it, and, and I'm all good to go. So That's awesome. Danny, I'm guessing you're a little bit closer to us now. Yeah, yeah. So um... – I was at home too for most of it, staying along with Joey, like six of us under one roof for, you know, two, three, four weeks. But I've been going back and forth between campus because I can't leave my roommate Dre alone for too long because he's been staying here the whole time. But yeah, uh, I just finished my first year, my master's program. Um, I had an internship this summer, but that just got canceled yesterday. So I've just been playing a lot of golf recently because that's the only thing you can do. But yeah. What's your master's in? Uh, sports management. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And Mark, are you in somewhere sunnier than the rest of us? Yeah, them? I, I am. And uh, I'm a lot older than these guys. So what I've been up to since college is going to take a lot longer than these guys are like, yeah, last week I played golf. That's all I've been up to. <laughs> um, I just moved to LA uh, about a year ago. So I'm, I'm currently in Los Angeles. Um, I lived in Columbus. I graduated Ohio State in 2010. So uh, I, I stayed in Columbus until last year. I moved out here and I, I reluctantly moved out here uh, because I, I work in national sports media and there's only so many opportunities in Columbus, Ohio, unfortunately. Um, so I very reluctantly moved out here and it, it, it took like probably the full year before I, I was like, okay, I kind of actually like it out here. So um, I'm slowly going Hollywood, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if I'll be welcome back to Ohio. When the, the, I came back one time and all my friends just roasted me how tan, tan I was and I'm skinny now and all that kind of stuff. But um, I don't know. That, that's, that's basically what I'm up to now. <laughs> always be welcome back, but they'll always make fun of you too. So yeah, absolutely. It's fair. It's, it's totally fair. I get it. <laughs> you, you know, 
Mark, I got. I mean, I want to start with you because you kind of set, I think, in a lot of ways, the tone for the the walk on persona and and this idea yeah. of what a walk on could be. Where did that come from? Like, what what was it like when uh, you became a walk on, and how did you evolve it? Yeah, I'll say first of all, I don't really feel like I I invented the idea of being a goofball on the bench. Like that certainly didn't start with me. It was more like I I think I I put a spotlight on it. Um, so. The, for me, it was just like, I, I was used, and I'm sure these, the, the other guys will, will, will chime in and, and maybe they'll agree with me. Like, I was so used to just being the best player on my team in high school and just being so good at basketball that it was really hard for me to get to Ohio State and be told that I suck and that you're never going to play. Um, and, and I just had like a, a, I think my first two years I was playing really hard. And, and Joey actually got a ton of playing time. So Joey's like, yeah, I don't know what that feels like. But, <laughs> not to play. Um, but my first two years, like I was, I, I, I took it super seriously and I was, you know, trying to crack the rotation and all that. And then uh, I think I just had like a moment after my sophomore year where I was like, it, this is going to kill me, like not playing. Um, I have to, I have to either change my approach or transfer. And I thankfully did not, I, I was smart enough to know that like having a degree from Ohio state was super valuable. And like the experience I had um, being on the team was going to help me in the long run more than if I transferred to like, I don't know, some smaller school and, and average 10 points a game, like uh, no one would have cared, you know? So I was thinking big picture. I decided to stick at Ohio state, but I just had to change my mindset. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, I got to just have as much fun as I possibly can in my last two years. And that's kind of what I did. And like, I started my blog and, and the idea of me being like a media guy is hilarious because I had no, um, I had no plan for this. This was not my goal with any of this. I, I keep like, even now I work for Fox. I, I moved to LA. Like I, I feel like I'm kind of settling in into a media career. I still am sort of looking over my shoulder, waiting for someone to be like, all right, the, the party's over. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's all over now, buddy. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I just basically just wanted to have as much fun as possible. Uh, I did it purely, purely from a, a, a standpoint of like, I want this to be fun. There was no, like, I, I think I could make money from this. I think I could do it, turn this into a career. It was just basically like my teammates are out of their minds and so am I, and the world should know about this. So I just started writing stories and, uh, yeah, here I am. What is it like 11, 12 years later now? Man, I'm old. A legend. <laughs> So Joey, you know, you, you you come after this where, you know, I mean, Mark writes a book, you know, we have this whole kind of phenomenon of, of this experience of a walk-on. You really carved your own niche though. I mean, you, you, you know, there was no one that got a bigger cheer uh, on the bench, off the bench, it didn't matter than you did. Talk us through kind of your approach to being a walk-on. Yeah, so similar to Mark, I mean, like, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say, like, I went into Ohio State knowing who Mark was and what it meant to be a walk-on at Ohio State. Did I think I was going to embrace that the way I kind of did? Absolutely not, because I fell into the same kind of category as, like, I'm not just going to roll over and accept my role at the end of the bench. Like, I, just like Mark said, was a really good basketball player in high school. And I, you know, I did. I knew I was going to Ohio State making a gigantic sacrifice for my playing career. Like, I'm not, I'm not dumb, but at the same time, I was like, they don't they don't know what they're getting in me like I, I I got something to prove so but I will say like the first few times I went in like and you go you look up your name on Twitter because every college kid does that when they first go into a game and I'm seeing everyone saying like I got a trillion I got a trillion and I knew what that was and in the back of my head I'm like I don't want a trillion <laughs> like I want I want to I want to score I want to shoot I want to throw the ball out of bounds I want to you know make mistakes like <laughs> Like, I, you know, and, and me and Titus have talked about this a billion times about how we have done very similar things and very different things at the same time. But my role as far as being a walk-on was I, I always made fun of myself and I was always an outgoing guy. So, like, I wasn't just going to change that just because of the seriousness of college basketball. And my first two years, like, it wasn't easy because we frankly weren't that good. Um, and then winning cures everything. So then my second two years were really good. Like my leash got longer in terms of, Hey, feel free to tweet that feel free to post this video, you know? So, and obviously more people started knowing who I was because we were better and because I was older and I'd, you know, been that guy that everyone was like, Oh, Joey Lane's still on the team. It seems like he's been there for eight years, you know? So um, my, I just embraced being a walk on as, Hey, like these guys work their butts off. Like I'm going to be that positive guy that, you know, lightens the mood 
whether it's the coaches, whether it's the fans, whether it's my teammates, whether it's for myself. I mean, cause Mark talked about it. It's so hard to do what we do. Like I was just going to just make a joke of myself at least to, for, for whatever it was worth to, to just impact my journey just a little bit more. And I, I totally hear what you're saying. And, and you use the term like make a joke of yourself. I don't, I mean, I definitely didn't view it that way. I, you were beloved. All of you have, are beloved. And, you know, and Danny, I'm, I'm wondering, like, you know, you shared this, this space in the spotlight with Joey, you know, but, but the experience looked like it was far different for you, but, but just as beloved in your own way. Just, can you talk about kind of what that was like for you? Yeah, my, I mean, my path is pretty different than Mark and Joey's, and I was just humbled that you guys even put me in their category for this. But, uh, this Watterson thing, man, we're bonded. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, like I, I thought my sports career was done in high school after I had to get uh, double hip surgery. But then like senior year of high school, we, my teammate to the state finals, we ended up losing, but I got an offer for Air Force um, to go to the Air Force Academy. So I played there for two years. And I didn't know if I wanted to stay in the military for, you know, the rest <laughs> of my life, you know, pick that. I was 21, like, and I don't want to commit my life at that point. So then I was talking with a few people and, you know, the Ohio State thing came up and I knew they were, you know, there was a coaching change happening, and I know Jay Sean um, since growing up playing with him, so I talked to him a little bit too. And you know, the opportunity to come back to Ohio State and be a part because I still love the game. I mean, I knew what I was getting into. I probably wasn't going to get a shot at all, so I knew that coming in. I just wanted to be a part of the game and help in any way I could. And I think that was what drove me to come here, be back home with my family, friends, just the opportunity that you know Ohio State has. It's like a global brand and. You know, that was really special to me just coming back home. And then when I got here, you know, it was I wouldn't have changed it for the world. It was the best decision I ever made. My friends, family, like teammates, these people, like Mark doesn't even know. Um, so, like, I went to the national championship game. I saw him on the bench way back. And then a few years down the road, I saw him at Upper Arlington being a substitute teacher in an open yeah. gym game. And yeah. now I'm out here, and now I'm talking with him on a, you know, a Zoom call and, you know, this quarantine. So it's just, it's just crazy all the things that can happen. But yeah, it was a great time for me. I remember that, by the way, I remember going to Upper <laughs> Arlington to play pickup. Uh, I, I was invited by, I forget who invited, whoever the senior was on your team that year. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I was so out of shape. I, I, I hadn't played basketball in like three or four years at that point. I was like, yeah, I'll go play with the high school kids. It'll be fun. And you guys were playing so hard. And I was like, I, I, this is, this is a disaster. <laughs> And then I got invited back next week, and I was like, absolutely not. I was still icing my legs. Colin, <laughs> yeah. oh, we have some questions. You want to throw a couple at them? Yeah, one of these uh, from Randy, Mark, and Joey both kind of touched on this, but if you guys wouldn't maybe expanding, uh, Mark, you first, what was kind of the decision-making process for you guys in going to Ohio State instead of maybe a smaller school yeah. uh, that would have led to more playing time or something? Uh, so my, I, I was, I got recruited by a lot of smaller schools and I, I'll be honest, I just didn't love basketball. I did I, every, everywhere I, I went, like, I love the game of basketball, but I didn't love like being a player. I didn't love, uh, the idea of like a year round, um, working my butt off at, at and, um, and, and everywhere I visited and everywhere, every coach I talked to, I kept getting like the same advice from people as I went through the process, which is like, if you if you showed up on campus and broke your leg or had some career ending injury from sports, would you still be happy here? And like every school that was recruiting me, I was like, no, I wouldn't be happy. I wouldn't be happy at Indiana state. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like if I had to go to Indiana state as a normal student, no, I would not be happy in Terre Haute, Indiana. I'm sorry. Hey, Larry Bird, um, did it work for him? I know Larry Bird. Yeah. So that kept happening. And I was like, I eventually, by the time I was a senior, I was like, I think I'm just not going to play basketball in college. And then I just applied to schools. I applied to Harvard, Northwestern, Vanderbilt, and Ohio State were the four I applied to. And I got into Vanderbilt, did not get into Harvard or Northwestern. Um, and then, so basically came down to Ohio State and Vanderbilt. And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, I don't know a single person. The only reason I applied to Vanderbilt was because my parents love country music so much, and it's in Nashville, and they wanted to come visit me in Nashville all the time. And then uh, Greg, Greg Ode and Mike Conley uh, committed to Ohio State, and I was good friends with them. And Greg was like, you should just come to Ohio State. We would have a ton of fun. And I was like, yeah, sure. That does actually sound like a lot of fun. Uh, so I actually, I actually decided I was coming to Ohio State. I never had been on campus. I'd never set a foot on campus. Wow. And uh, the first time I ever stepped foot on Ohio State's campus, I was moving into my dorm. So <laughs> wow. I don't know what that says about me, but uh, <laughs> it's a fun little Let it work out. <laughs> nugget about my story. Yeah. What about Joey, you? And if I was going to tackle the same question, I, I think my story is 
um, a little bit different in terms of like, I had my heart set on playing college basketball. I didn't care where it was. Granted, uh, I mean, I wanted to make sure it was a great school and close enough to home and, and all that good stuff. But, but I grew up a huge Ohio State fan. My mom is from Toledo. Um, she went to Ohio State, so did her whole family. So in the back of my head, it's like, well, that's the dream. You know, it's not very attainable, but that's the dream. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to, to be seen by some of the coaches when we went to uh, uh, the team camp in Columbus going into my senior year. And I played well enough where I was on their radar in terms of being a walk-on. So um, when push came to shove, um, I value, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be a pro. Um, and, uh, you know, I wanted to go to Ohio State versus some of the other Division II, Division three schools that I was looking at because um, I knew that it would leapfrog me, you know, into the, my professional career in, in the best way. So giving my, whether it was giving myself a platform as a player and, and as a student athlete or um, the education in general, I, I, I valued Ohio State above the others, you know, separate from basketball. Um, as the best place for me and and couple that with the fact that it was my dream to go there and to be an athlete at Ohio State my whole life uh, it ended up being a really really easy decision that I don't know why it took so long for me to make but um, I I mean best decision I ever made obviously. Well Danny you had a little different pathway though and, and Addison wants to know about the process of leaving academy so you know not only making that decision to leave there but but then looping that into coming here. Yeah so actually like um I didn't want to be a walk on when I, you know, left high school. <laughs> like I just, I wanted to go play somewhere and, you know, Air Force was my you know only option. And once there, you know, I went through basic training twice. So it was actually hard to leave because the amount of basically, you know, you went through hell basically going, going there. And I had gone through all the hard stuff and it was a week before my junior year starts. So right before your junior year, you, you sign something, you commit and you sign over, you know, five to 10 years to the military. So I made that, I was the last person actually in my class to leave before uh, junior year. And then once I made that, it was like based, I was, I was making a, like a leap of faith to come here. Cause I didn't know I had my life planned if I stayed there and coming here, you know, actually when I first got here with the basketball team, I walk into the locker room and I'm, and Gio, Mountain Man, very nice to me. He comes up to me and he says, "Hey, if you steal my steal my deodorant, I'm gonna I'm gonna beat the you know out of you." <laughs> and now we're great friends today. So like that's just like <laughs> what happens. But it ended up being an awesome decision. I want to trade it for the world. Welcome to the show. So Connor uh, has a question about the most difficult thing about being a walk on. What what is it, that, Danny? Maybe you can start and tell us like you know what's the hardest part. Uh, for me, I think the hardest part was, you know, you put in the work all the time, but you never know what's you know expected of you. So, like, when it comes to games, you know you're probably not going to play, but there's always that in the back of your mind, there's that shot that something may happen. You know, <laughs> someone gets hurt, you know. But so, like, you want to be a part of it, but you still got to have that slight focus, you know, if something happens. So that's always, you know, what's hard for me is just staying constantly, like, ready if something were to happen. And a couple times this year it did. There's foul trouble and people got hurt or suspended or something. You know, and I had to, <laughs> and I had to jump in. But that was that was a hard Get part. Two of them out of this for right now. <laughs> Mark, what was what was the hardest part for you? Uh, the hardest part for me is definitely that the general public thinks I suck at basketball, and that is not true at all. So the hardest part is guys <laughs> challenging right, me right now. This is it. Yeah, yeah. Th this is that's the hardest thing. Is like any time. Um, yeah, I don't know. You just have to constantly remind people that I am much better. The, the, the average person, I am much, much better at basketball than you are. And yet, like, I get challenged all the time. Like, I, some guy on Twitter last night was, like, trying to challenge me to, like, a shooting contest. And I'm like, dude, that's insulting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, people, especially guys like Joey and I who kind of leaned into it and, and, and weren't afraid to kind of make fun of how bad we were and all that kind of stuff, um, that has become my brand is, like, not being good at basketball. So people think I'm not good at basketball. And every so often I have to remind people that uh, I can play a little bit. So that, that's definitely the most frustrating and hardest part is just the perception of how good I am. Because it's something, like I said before, like, I took great pride in being a great basketball player my whole life. Like, that was – that was a big deal to me. And even when I got to Ohio State, I was like, no, I'm still good. Like, I was, I was friends with Greg and Mike. I, there, was a, there was a moment in time I vividly remember I was a better basketball player than Greg Oden. Now, we were in, like, an eighth grade, <laughs> but I was better than him. And he'll tell you the same. And 
So, like, when I got to Ohio State, like, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, Greg's a little better than me. He's not that much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just – I having that ego hit and then now like as you're an old man people just think you're so so bad uh that's the worst part is is definitely that <laughs> what about you Joey yeah I, beyond Mark's point because I you know yeah I got to contribute a little bit like I I had I had my moments where people were like oh my god why isn't Joey playing I mean Mark I remember Mark texting me one time he said you're in the perfect sweet spot right now because You'll never have to play in any meaningful moments in the game, but everybody thinks you should be playing. Yeah, so you, it's great. <laughs> you're in the perfect zone where, you know, you can do no wrong. So um, beyond that point, because I totally agree, like, with the fact that people think that I'm not a good basketball player, like, that's just ridiculous. Me, Danny, and, and Mark could take anyone three on three. That's, yeah. cl that's clearly obvious. But I would say to go off of Danny's point, the fact that um, – you take it upon yourself and work so incredibly hard, specifically like strength and conditioning wise to not use it at all. Basically was the most frustrating thing for me. Cause we have like all of these different conditioning tests that I would work so dang hard for just to pass one time and then never need it again for the rest of the year. Um, whereas these other guys who are playing 40 minutes a game, they need that conditioning stuff. I mean, me and Danny, we would put in so much time and effort to make these different running tests that we had to make because like we're probably not as good of athletes as these other guys are. So we have to work really hard to make some of the easy, you know, times and different things. So do that. It was the hardest part for me. It's, it, that's a very specific part of it, but the, but the, the effort and the hard work that you have to do to, to not really see the shine of it all. That's, that's kind of hard, but you, you sign up for it. You know what you're signing up for. Colin, what do you got for him? Yeah, we have a couple of questions about, actually becoming a walk-on the tryout process you know what it looked like for you guys how do, and how you prepared yourself mark if you want to start yeah uh so as is the case with most things my path is unusual uh, <laughs> i feel like that's, that about uh, you. that's yeah <laughs> like everyone asks me even like what i do for a living now people are like how do i get into sports media and i'm like i be friends with greg odin i guess yeah those start a blog. like <laughs> like i I, I am very much a case of just like survivorship bias and just unbelievable luck and being at the right place at the right time. Uh, so my story is I, I didn't have to try out. Um, I, I was a manager. I, so I was friends with Greg and Mike. I went to Ohio state. I get on campus, uh, coach Mata and, and coach gross, uh, John gross. He's the head coach at Akron. Now he's, he was the top assistant for coach Mata when I was there. Um, they, they had known me cause through, I played AAU with Greg and Mike, so through recruiting those guys, they got they got to know me a little bit because they would they would even talk to me like after they'd come watch our AAU games and then they talk to me about like what Greg and Mike like and, and what they're into, you know, like they were recruiting them through me so in a little way uh, in some ways. Um, so they knew me well enough. They asked me to be a manager. Uh, they told me that meant I could practice with the team, and I was like, yeah, that sounds cool. I could scratch my basketball itch a little bit, but uh, not have to commit full time to working out all the time and all that. So I agreed to be a manager and I showed up and I was rebounding for Greg and Mike the whole all day and wiping up their sweat. And I was like, this is not what I was promised. Uh, so I did that for about two weeks. I quit because I just couldn't take it anymore. I was filming practice. Like it's, it's bad enough to be a manager, but to watch your friends again, like I showed up at Ohio state. I thought like Greg and Mike were just a little bit better than I was. Cause I was just so used to, I mean, they're my friends. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bow down to them and, you know, kiss their feet and pretend like they're the greatest thing ever. So the idea of like, having to wash their laundry was not appealing to me. So I quit. Um, and then they eventually like guys, I remember Ron Lewis rolled his ankle. Sam Payne was the walk on before me. He had quit because he, they played their first exhibition game. He thought he should be starting or something on a team that ended up <laughs> competing for a national championship. He didn't get enough playing time. So he quit. So they found themselves with nine players. They didn't have 10 to run five on five. And uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a relationship with Coach Mata and, and, and Coach Gross. So they called me and they were like, hey, we need bodies. We know that you can play a little bit because we watched you play AU. Will you just come to practice and, and just, you know, just basically just be out there so we can play five on five? And I said, sure. And that turned into a four year stint as a walk on. So that's pretty much how I did it. It's, it's ridiculous. The more, the more times I recount that story, the more I'm like, that makes no sense. <laughs> oh, we make better friends than the ones we have now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Danny what about you yeah mine mine was uh mine was different too so um as I was leaving the Air Force or 
notifying people I was leaving. A couple of my coaches at Air Force reached out to Ohio State and my AU coach, my high school coach. So I was fortunate enough that um, before, you know, finalizing that decision, Ohio State was going to, you know, take me take me on as a walk-on. So that made it easier for me to come here. What I didn't know was I knew they were very short-handed, so I knew there was a possibility. And Joey can attest to that because that was the year when, when everyone transferred. So it like everyone was gone or <laughs> kicked out or something. <laughs> something. Um, but I, what I didn't know was um, one of my friends too was also walking on that year, which was Matt Lehman. He played at played at Waterson. So you know, me, Connor, Joey, and Matt. Connor was another walk on that year from Utah. We, we were the four horsemen that year, the Green Machine, whatever we called ourselves. That was, <laughs> but that's how it all started. And Joey, your story? Yeah. So um, somehow, some way, I ended up being a recruited walk on where they recruited me and courted me to come to Ohio State, which obviously they did not have to do at all. But um, basically, uh, going into my senior year, they uh, saw me play um, at, the, at Ohio State's team camp, as I mentioned before. Um, and we were the only team, only high school team from Illinois. I'm, I'm from Chicago, so we were the only team, high school team from Illinois. And we were just beating up on all the Ohio teams. I mean, they must have not known who we were because we were playing some teams that I swear were – I hope they were freshman or sophomore teams. Um, and, and we – the first day we won every game, like, by – literally 35 points and um I remember specifically coach Paulus Greg Paulus comes up to our coach after and says hey coach like we're gonna get you guys some better competition tomorrow and we were we were by no means we were the best team in Illinois or anything we weren't um but we were a really good high school team and so then we ended up playing um some guys that Ohio State well uh, that, that they were recruiting the next day guys like Khalil Iverson who ended up going to Wisconsin and um we played Toledo St. John's who every year has you know, incredible talent and stuff. And we ended up winning those games also. So we ended up going undefeated and winning the team camp or whatever. Um, and at the end of it, uh, one of the coaches came up to me after um, uh, the head of uh, recruiting, uh, Coach Sparts, and just said, hey, you know, um, we like you. Um, we're not – we can't offer you a scholarship, obviously. We know you're, we know you're a huge Ohio State fan. Um, he said, you know, me personally, I would like to help you out with whatever your next step is wherever you go. Um, just want to be a resource for you. So stayed in touch with him and, and got to talk to some other coaches and ended up going to, to a couple practices and going to, to a game. Um, and it wasn't, that was, you know, in the summer uh, through the winter. And then it wasn't until the end of April when finally I got a call um, that said, Hey, uh, you know, if you want to walk on, there's a spot for you. And uh, obviously I said, yes, on the spot. Um, and then they also told me there is one, there is one caveat though. You can't, you can't tell anyone. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Eagle, Eagle man, Coach Eaglehoff said, hey, uh, you know, we've never had a recruited walk-on before, um, you know, where you kind of announce your commitment or whatever. So you're just going to have to try out as a formality. Like, we're only going to take you as the walk-on. But and, and I was like, okay, like, I don't care what I have to do. This is my dream, so I'm going to do it. Fast forward again um, to, to the spring game that year. I, I went because I had only visited Ohio State like once as a student. So I wanted to see it again. Um, and I went to the football game and, and the coaches saw me and said, hey, just so you know, you can, you can tell whoever you want now. We've decided that you're good to go. Weirdest, weirdest couple. They just, it was like three or four weeks. Joey, they just didn't want you to do the hat. They, they, wanted to, they, wanted, they didn't want your hat situation. <laughs> right. They didn't want me to make that graphic yeah. in 90 different schools. Right. Out. Yeah. But it, I don't know why – I. I, I ended up posting on Facebook, I think, because that's where – that's those are the people who cared where I was going to school. But, you know, they, I, I guess it was – they just wanted the formality of the tryout, and then they never had a tryout in my four years. So I don't know what the what the deal wow. was. But, but yeah, that's kind of how I got there. Wow. <laughs> so, Joey, I'm sure it was challenging. You talked about, I mean, them recruiting you and Ohio State wanting you, but then also not getting to play on a scholarship. What was that like for you? Yeah, let me rephrase. <laughs> they didn't want me. They needed me. That's why I was coming there. You know, it, they weren't begging me to come. It was, uh, you know, I, I said, hey, if you'll have me, I would love to come. That's what it was more more of it was like. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I knew what I I've said it a couple of times. I knew what I was signing up for. I, I wasn't expecting to play. You know, if, if I got in in the last two minutes of games and got a chance to, you know, throw up some shots, great. You know, but the experience itself was – 
uh, in my mind, worthwhile enough for me to, to, to not worry about the playing time and stuff, uh, not worry about the scholarship. I was going to be paying to go to these other schools anyway. So I might as well have the greatest experience I can um, if I'm going to pay for school. I mean, does the money ever become an issue, though? You know, because you could have gone somewhere else and maybe gotten some money, maybe not a full ride, but partial scholarship. And at a certain point, you are surrounded by people who not only got a full ride, but are also, you know, now we're going to be dealing with things like name, image, and likeness. You're going to have people who are having all kinds of opportunities. You know, is how does the money affect you as, as a walk-on? I just think that, you know, I was fortunate enough to get, a, to get an academic scholarship to Ohio State. So, um, you know, that was... First and foremost, it made it, you know, obviously 10 times easier just in terms of money, if money was an issue and stuff. I was fortunate that my parents had saved up money for my school where they said, you go wherever you want. Um, you know, we, we got your back basically. But then also I was um, somehow, some way was put on scholarship for three out of my four years. So I lucked to talk about luck. I mean, I lucked into to an awesome situation. So, um, but yeah, that's kind of where I, where I stood on the, on the, on the topic. I mean, you guys, Mark and Danny, you guys were in state, but still money, money's money. Money, for me, it wasn't so much the money because I was, um, like a lot of college kids, like it's it's all like theoretical. You just take out loans and like, you're like, who cares? I'll deal with that when I'm, I'll, I'll deal with that when I'm really old, you know, when I'm like 25, <laughs> like when I'm, you know, who cares? Uh, so I didn't really think that much about it. For me, it was the, the, the bigger thing was like uh, training table, like not being able to go, like, getting cut out from that and um there were there were certain like perks that all the scholarship guys got that I didn't get and it just always felt like it always felt like when you're sitting like the front row of coach in an airplane and like the the flight attendants come and like close the curtains and you're like oh like that's how that's how it felt all the time for me it was like like you know we get done with practice and I turn to Greg and be like hey you want to go do something he's like I gotta go to training table and I was like damn so I guess I'll just sit outside of training table and wait for you to get done. Cause they wouldn't let me go in to eat, uh, um, stuff like that. Like I didn't get, I didn't always get priority with, with classes. Like all the other guys did. I I'm trying to think other, it, it was all like really small stuff, but like when everyone, all of my friends in college were, were teammates. Like I didn't do like when you're, when you're a walk on it, maybe the guys, they probably have better social lives than I did, but I, I just was spending so much time with the basketball team that like, I never had, I didn't really have any friends outside of that. So basically my entire experience was like all of my friends got to go do these cool, cool things every so often. And I didn't, and I just have to sit there in my dorm or in my apartment and just be like, I'll just wait for you guys to be done, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the worst. Yeah. Danny, we're not allowed to eat with the team either. No, they must've changed a lot of stuff. Cause Joey can talk oh, yeah. about We didn't, we had, <laughs> Well, the, cause I probably, I probably everything. complained about it so much. He I was probably just like, book. He, I mean, God, he's I mean, the for everything. You're we welcome, got, we you got, guys. <laughs> we had most of the benefits too. And in the social life, I feel like it was um, best of both worlds. Cause <laughs> <laughs> like, but uh, I was forced to have an air force. I was on scholarship there for, well, I went to prep school too. So I was on scholarship there for three years out there in Colorado. But then coming here, um, I got lucky you know, enough, as Joey said, too, like, uh, they retroactively put me on a scholarship for one year because they didn't fill all theirs. And then when uh, Potter left or whatever, they put me on his scholarship for the rest of the year. So out of my three years here, I was on it for a year and a half. So I mean, I was I was fortunate enough to get that. But we got priority scheduling. <laughs> like, <I don't> <laughs> You have Mark is like the foundation for you. He is the grandfather. Are these guys? Are these guys even walk-ons? What are they doing? They got Damn. lane time. They got scholarships. They got like it doesn't even sound like a walk-on to me. We walked onto the team though. So what does that make? Yeah. Us? Joey Joey's getting recruited and getting a scholarship and getting playing time, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm a walk-on. I had a hard life." Wait, define playing time. Define playing time. Let's let's not stretch it out too much, okay? Listen to these guys. Unbelievable. <laughs> we do have to talk about your playing time, though, because, you know, I, I mean, I, I have the great fortune. I cover a lot of basketball games for the Associated Press. And no matter what I'm doing, I would always know, Joey, when you were coming into the game because the place would explode. And so tell me what it's like when the crowd – I mean, literally, you know, we've all had that moment the crowd goes wild, but the crowd really does go wild when you guys come into a game. Danny, what does that feel like? And, and Joey, what does that feel like? And, and Mark, I'm not sure about you if yours was the same. <laughs> but what, what does it feel like when, when you really are the most popular player on the court? 
How Joey, do you want to take it first? Yeah, want sure, to sure, sure, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll um, so I think Joey – I don't even remember this watching Mark's games, but Joey's – I think Joey started this trend where they just, I don't know, cheer for the walk I don't know, at Ohio State at the end of it because um, this year there were a few instances where I think it caught – pulled off off guard is Villanova game, which they right. put me in at the end. It was kind of close, but – he, he was forced to because the fans <laughs> they where he didn't want to because a couple of the guards weren't playing as good, and, but he had to because the place was about to erupt. And then what I thought was crazy, we were playing at Nebraska. I don't even know there was a thing where their fans started cheering my name. The whole had to take a double take, like, what the heck is going on? So <laughs> ended up putting me in and scored the crowd went crazy. But I think, I mean, that – I think Buckeye Nation, but that was awesome. Like that, just that experience, and you know, I'll cherish that forever. But Joey, Joey started that. I feel like, but it was awesome. Joey, how no, much I just go through. I mean, come on. Yeah, I, that. I mean, people talk about what they miss most. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that besides like my teammates and and the team atmosphere and stuff, when we're up by a hundred and they start chanting my name, like not only do you are you excited because you're probably going to go in, but you also realize that. You, you won the game and that the coaches aren't mad and practice will probably be a little easier the next day because there's a lot of relief that kind of leaves your body at that point. Um, but I just – whenever I think about playing, there was a couple instances where Coach Mata was very funny about it. He would – like there was one game where I went in against Northwestern, obviously being from Chicago. I had a lot of family there, so he wanted – at Northwestern, we were up nine with like eight seconds left. So he put me in for those last eight seconds. People went nuts. Like coolest moment of my life probably – being in front of all my family and stuff. Um, but when I went in, he, he grabbed me as I'm going in and he says, uh, he says, don't mess it up. And those weren't his exact words. But he said, don't mess this up. So like, that's kind of how coach Mata was. He was funny about it, you know? And like, he would give me shit if I missed a, excuse my language. Sorry. He would, he would, he would, he would make fun of me in the locker room for missing an open three or something after the game. So like, that was the way he kind of went about it. Whereas coach Holman, he looked at it like it was a show. He, I remember there was one game against Maryland where we were up by we were up by a bunch and uh he could have put me in with like five minutes left if he wanted to which he had done in the past which caught me very off guard but he could have put me, but he waited until after the under four timeout and he got like Kyle Young and some of the freshmen like Musa that weren't playing that much that game and and then he told me as we're coming away he said don't worry I didn't forget about you I just got to make sure you get your own cheer <laughs> so <laughs> So then, of course, the crowd starts chanting for me to come in. He subs me in to take off my shoes and all that stuff. People go insane, and he and he always knew he's a he's a showman. He he wanted he wanted to get the people you know foaming at the mouth for some Joey Lane. So um, that Coach Holman was very very funny about it. Um, he I mean even up until the last point um, you know against Houston and in my last game and and the NCAA tournament when he subbed me in with like a minute and a half left because that game was over. And he wanted to give me my little curtain call or whatever. He said, "If you're open, you better chuck that thing up." So, um, you know, even even then, you know, he he was really cool about trying to get me in. You know, as Danny said, like there are plenty of times where I had teammates that messed up, and that's the reason why I was going in. Or it was because you know, student sections. You know, at Wisconsin, they were yelling for me to go in when one year, and, and he put me in at the end of the game and stuff. So there was a whole bunch of instances. So you got to be on your toes. But um, that obviously, I missed that most. I can uh, I'll back up Joey with Coach Mata. I I obviously didn't play for for Coach Holman. I was a four year Mata guy, and um, he he did the exact same thing to me all the time. He always saved it for like when we were up like a million, and there was ten seconds left, and he put me in, and I'd I'd be walking to the scores table, and then he'd stop. He'd be like, he'd be like Titus, come come back, and I'd, I'd be like, yeah, what is it, Coach? And I'd expect him to say like, I don't. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna run this play or whatever, and he'd just be deadpan. He'd be like, don't f this up. <laughs> and then he'd slap me on the butt and I'd go back out. <laughs> and we're up by four. Like there's no like if I drop kick the ball every time I touched it, we wouldn't lose, you know. Um so for me, like I I every time I got in the game, it was a whirlwind. And I I can barely even remember I all of my memories of moments of playing in games are are retroactive in the sense that like they're actually the memories of like I'll watch the film after they happen. I don't remember anything about being out there. Um, it is always just an absolute whirlwind of just like not wanting to screw up, but also like wanting to appease the fans who are that, – that's kind of why I started the Trillion idea was because like it, it was too much pressure. It was like I don't know what everyone <laughs> – Every, like half the people want me to shoot it every time I touch it the coaches are yelling at me like don't screw this like 
I, I, I didn't know what to do half the time. I was like, I, uh, what do I do? Uh, so I decided I'm just going to make my brand like doing nothing. I'm just going to stand in the corner. because This is too much. But, um, I remember one time, uh, my, my big, uh, my, my one story I have about playing was, uh, we, we were playing Iowa. I think it was, uh, we were up by a, a ton at Iowa at home. Uh, it was my senior year. And, um, Coach put me in. I, I never, I never went in until after the under four timeout. That was a big thing. It was like it, it was seen as disrespectful, I think, to to the other coaches, um, if if you put in your walk ons before the under four timeout. So, but but the Iowa game, he throws me in. Coach Mata, there's like five minutes and twenty seconds left, and he's like, "Mark, get in there." And I was like, "I'm sorry, what?" It's <laughs> like, Coach, there's you're like three minutes early on this. He's like, "No, nah, we're gonna get you some ex- extended run here." And I was like, "Oh my god." I am not in shape for this. Uh, so I ended up playing the five minutes. So the the whole point of this is that the under four timeout happens, uh, the media timeout happens, and we go to the to the uh, to the bench, and I have no idea where to sit, and I'm just standing there, just like I'm not. I've never once sat down in a timeout once. I'm always on standing on the fringes. Uh, I'm trying to hit on the cheerleaders or like the the sideline recorder or whatever. That's like always what I do during the timeouts. <laughs> And so now I have to sit there and like pay attention. And even as he's like talking to me, my mind just starts wandering because I'm just so used to like paying attention to the timeout promotions, just whatever else is going on <laughs> that I'd, ne- I'd never been like locked in. And it was so bizarre because he's drawing up plays and he's like telling me where to go. And I was like, I'm having an out of body experience right now. Cause this is so weird that I'm hearing coach Mata say my name in a timeout huddle that has never happened in four years. Um, but yeah, it was it was all just a whirlwind, and I just did my bit. It just felt like I was riding a bucking bronco, and I was like, I just got to survive these two minutes, whatever it is, and then uh, hope I don't screw up too badly. I had one shot in a corner one time where, like, er- even every time I shot, it was just like I was just going on muscle memory. I was like, I don't know what's happening. Ah, and it, I just throw it up. <laughs> and one time, I remember shooting in the corner, and as the ball left my hand, I was like, Oh my god, I, I'm gonna hit the side of the backboard. Please don't hit the side of the backboard. Please don't. And then it just barely missed and I bricked it really badly but I was like oh thank god because if, if I hit the side of the backboard do you guys Danny and, and Joey do you guys have any like super embarrassing moments of air balls or, yes, or please share those. I um so we played Penn State I I had scored already that year so that had been that weight had been lifted off my shoulders but I caught the ball in the corner and I I pride growing up I prided myself on having like a really quick release like when you're short and and you, you gotta have a quick release obviously so like I worked really hard on that and I probably got it off a little too fast. It was, if I was 25 feet away from the basket, I probably shot at 35 feet. It was so long. And on Twitter, people are roasting me. And I'm like, guys, I'm human. Like walk on to <laughs> air ball too. Like you're LeBron, if LeBron James hit, shoots a step back and air balls it, you know, he wipes his hands, looks at him or whatever. Right. Like I didn't yeah. even do that. I was just like, Hey, I air ball. Sorry. I air haven't ball. touched the ball in 30 38 minutes of, of, of game time, you know, like yeah. that happens. So that, I mean, people took, people took a charge on me. I'm like, what are you taking a charge on me for? I'm just trying to like, come on, we have a mutual agreement that we're going to let each other score right now. Like, what are you taking a charge on me for? Stuff like that. Did you guys have the feeling of like the, the whirlwind? Cause I, I remember my freshman year, I threw an alley-oop to David Lighty. I've, n- I've thrown maybe I can count on one hand alley-oop even attempts that I've tried to throw in my entire life. And for some reason, I just like, it was, like I said, it was just like something came over me. I'm dribbling the ball and I was like, I guess I'm going to throw it up. And I just threw it up. And like, I look back on it. It's like, I blacked out. I don't even remember what happened. I was like, why did I throw that? I've never thrown an alley hoop like ever. And it worked out. But uh, did you guys have moments like that? Or am I alone in this? Absolutely. I, I could tell you every play from every single game that I didn't play in, but the games that Before. I did play in, there are some splotchy moments where I don't know yeah. what happened. Like, like you said though, Titus, like because of the replays, like I know what happened. Like right. I'm proud of the same thing. Like I threw an alley oop in a game. I, I there was no one on my high school team over six foot. You know, like I wasn't throwing alley oops in high school. So like that was really really cool. But do I remember it happening? Not really. No. I think the hardest part was going from sitting down for an hour and a half, two hours to full throttle (laughs) that you can't train for that like Uh, that is not a thing so no my most embarrassing moment was because I I don't know how they feel but I just wanted to get the basket out of the way early on in the season because because I like passing the ball making the great assist (laughs) first or second game of the year I thought oh I got an easy breakaway layup like just get actually hammered into the baseline like full-on like coaches (laughs) like like in that 
after that, I was like, all right, I'm just going to get this bucket done and then, and then move on. But no, that was it. You, you definitely figured out this year, Danny, that you get an easier chance to score if you shoot from further away. You're too busy trying to go in amongst the trees. Yeah. We're not welcomed in there. Trying to break some ankles. That's, <laughs> you know. Well, you have a, a – some Joey and, and Danny have a friend on here, uh, Adam from Sasso, who uh, used to be your Sasso counselor, I believe. Um, and he's asking yeah. kind of what it was like to be uh, from the academic standpoint. Uh, you know, did you ever feel – like you were, and, and same for you, Mark, um, you know, motivating your teammates from that academic standpoint? Uh, I don't know if motivating is the right word because uh, it's, it's pretty hard to get some of those guys motivated, as I'm sure <laughs> you guys will agree. Um, but I do remember feeling like a parent sometimes, just like, <laughs> hey, man, like, why, why, is co why are these coaches telling me that you're not doing your homework? Like, I don't care if you do your homework or not, but I don't want them to tell me that you're not doing your homework. So they, please figure it out. If you want my help, like, I'm more than happy to help you. Like, I remember I was rooming with, with Caleb Wesson on a road trip, and I helped him with an assignment and stuff because he had some questions, and, like, I had done it already before, you know. So, like, I was more than happy to help. And Danny, Danny even helped me, and I helped Danny, you know. So, like, it's not like, it's not like we were immune to, to that stuff. Um, but it, it's yeah. funny. The stereotype that walk-ons have to hold up the team GPA is 100% true. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. There was a semester where I didn't have 3.0 GPA, and the first call I got was from my assistant coach that said, is everything okay? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just taking really hard classes, you know? Like, so, um, yeah, it, there was definitely, you know, you, you know, you got to pick from a handful of things, whether it's having a, a social life and being great at basketball and doing well in school. And you can – sometimes you only pick two out of those three things. And I definitely – um, chose more of the school side. So I had, I had my moments of, of working really hard in school when it felt like it made no sense, but um, it, it, it was definitely important. Yeah, there's that unsaid thing where you just got to stay on top of your, of your role as a walk and with your GPA. And if you're getting talked to by the coaches, then you know something's up. I had, <laughs> so my first year I came here, I, you know, I couldn't travel because I transferred, but they ended up getting a waiver. My first game was at Purdue where we beat Purdue with uh, – with like that ending which was crazy mm -hmm. um but I had a test the next day at 8 a.m and we didn't get back till three or four in the morning three in the morning something like that so I didn't sleep end up getting like a 30 percent of the test and I got a couple calls from Scooney I think Adam might even call me too like what's going on I was like yeah they dropped one of the tests so just forget about that one <laughs> like, but, <laughs> but I you know just stuff end up getting on top of fish you know b plus something like that but like <laughs> little little things like that I remember like wow I almost like I almost got in trouble for that but yeah I I had some serious senioritis by the time um I my academic career wrapped and rock bottom for me as a walk-on because like these guys said like you, your entire role is almost just keep the GPA up and that's pretty much your value to the team um and I did that for a long time, but by, by the time I'd started my blog and it kind of like blew up and, and but by the time my, my second semester, my senior year, I realized I was probably going to do this as a career or at least have a job, right? Like I, I realized my blog and my identity through that was going to help me in my career more than um, school was at that point, which was a weird spot to be in. So I, I got some serious senioritis and I remember, uh, we had, we had guys checking, uh, it was, it was coach Mata's father-in-law would always check the, uh, uh, make sure people were going to class. Like that was his job. He volunteered to help out with that. Yeah. And, uh, he, he would go to, to Fisher and, and, uh, John Diebler and Kyle Madsen were both business school guys as well. I was a marketing major. So, uh, we would always have classes like around the same time. And I remember one day I was probably 45 minutes late to like a two hour, three hour class, whatever it was. I was, I was super late and I was, I, I don't know. I, I just completely checked. It was in the spring, my senior year at this point, I was like, well, yeah, whatever. Um, and I, but the basketball season was still going on. So they're still checking classes and he's there checking Kyle and me and Kyle and John Diebler all have class at the same time. And he's checking everyone's class and I'm super late. He's, he's sticking around like doing God knows what. I come walking into the to uh, show him bomb like 45 minutes late. He looks right at me, just dips his head and just kind of gives me a salute, keeps walking. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to run so many sprints. Like, I can't believe I got caught being this late, whatever. Not a peep. Nothing. It never comes up. No one ever mentions it to me. No one says a word to me about it. And I'm like, wow, they just like really don't care about me at all. 
And like, I, I just, I serve no purpose on this team. If it, Cause I, I expected something like Joey where I was going to get a call like, Hey man, we need you to keep this team GPA up. You got to be going to class, all that. And when they did that, I was so disrespected. I was like, man, do I do anything for this team? And was, <laughs> no, not really. As it turns out. <laughs> I, I remember uh, my freshman year. Um, I only got checked for one class and it just so happened that that class was with two of my teammates, but I didn't make that realization so, like, I just remember being so paranoid. Every class, I'd get there early, sit down, looking at the door, ready to give them the little salute, you know, like, I'm here. And then I never, ever had to do that unless I had a teammate in my class. And and me being the freshman with all this anxiety didn't realize that. And then slowly but surely, I was like, you know what? As long as I'm doing well, I don't think they are necessarily going to be on me so much. So, just take care of my business and, and, and don't worry about kids showing up to class 35 minutes early. Your teachers, like your professors like that. I would have liked that. <laughs> All right, we, we need, we have a, just a few more minutes and we have some people, a lot of people that want some advice from you guys. So one mm -hmm. thing is, you know, you were all, um, you talked about what, what tremendous athletes you, you were, and then you've been in college, you've been athletes in college. You're not athletes anymore. What's how do you make that transition? What advice do you have for kids who are facing the same circumstance where their their playing careers are done? If I had it figured out, that that'd be great. Um, I don't think I do. I mean, I have a job. I'm I'm currently in a sales job that I love doing because it has a lot of the similarities of being an athlete in terms of competitiveness and stuff. So just find so, whatever. If you, I'm assuming you love sports. Um, whether if you're in sports, great. If not, find something that you enjoy in a similar way and, and, and you'll be fine. I just, <laughs> if I had the answer, I would have given it to myself by now. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't quite know how to answer. Mark does. He's got all the wisdom. Yeah, though. <laughs> please. I, I was, I, I, it was really hard for me, man. I, I had some serious, uh, d bouts with depression after I got done playing. Um, it kind of went during my career at Ohio state too, but like it got really bad at, and I, I put on a ton of weight and, um, it, it, and, and a lot of it was that it was like my, my life was so rigid and structured and, uh, and I had everyone telling me where to go at what time and where to be there. And then now all of a sudden it was like, I'm my own man and I got to do all this on my own. I don't think I was really prepared for it. Um, but yeah, like kind of what Joey said is like, you got that competitive itch. Just, there are ways you can find it, whether it's through your job or not. Like, I, I think like I, I play pickup basketball every so often, but for me, um, I, I found I'm in love with running, which is really weird. I never ran more than a single mile until I was probably 26 years old. And then I started running and like, I, I became obsessed with like running faster times. And like that, that just became my new little outlet for like my competitiveness. So um, I don't know. I think, I think you got to just eventually do a trial and error with stuff and find, definitely stay in shape though. That'll sneak up on you. I think, I think that's the one thing is like athletes, just assume you have great metabolism and you're always going to be, yeah, I'll, I'm going to live forever and I can eat whatever I want because I've done it my whole life. And that, that is not true at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm a testament to that. I remember I stayed on, I stepped on the scale when I was at my fattest and I, I, I had a good idea of what the number was going to be and I knew it was going to be bad and it was 30 pounds more than what I thought it was going to be. And I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> That's so, yeah. Just keep, keep, uh, keep tabs on that. I think would be my advice. <laughs> yeah. You've been faced with it twice. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I would just say you might not realize it, but, you know, the lessons you've learned, the perseverance, competitiveness, leadership, you might not realize it in the moment, but that stuff is going to carry with you for the, you know, the rest of your day. So as long as you just, you know, understand what you've learned along the way, your journey, it'll help you in the future. But I'll say this, what I'm most proud about being a walk on with Ohio State is, you know, on especially Joe and I's teams, I don't know about Mark's, but our team's you know, we hung out on and off the court with everybody. There were no clicks. And I think that, you know, that aspect was something that really, that was really special for us because we were all friends, you know. That's awesome. We, we do have somebody on the call here who, who wants to be a walk-on. I mean, they, you know, this is something they're really interested in and they haven't had any luck getting in the right circles to get an opportunity. Is there a, a secret to this? Is there some advice that you could give someone who would want to be a walk-on at Ohio State of how they might be able to do that? Uh oh, you guys got real quiet. <laughs> well, that's that's a question that's, for, that's... for Danny and Joey. I mean, oh. I yeah, I don't, I don't, I I would say, um, yeah, like I said, I first of all, this, this coaching staff wasn't even my coaching staff. I mean, I know them pretty well, but I don't know how they they run that operation and all that. So I'm gonna defer to those two guys. Yeah, I there's, I, I mean, I 
I definitely get approached, you know, by different people with the same kind of question, you know, how, how I, I, I'm a huge Ohio State fan, just like you. How do I walk on, you know, I'm a freshman in Ohio State, you know, how do I get in contact with the coaches? And, you know, I think that the best um, answer, if you're coming out of high school and, and wanting to be a walk on anywhere, it's just, you know, it's a combination of, of hard work and, and luck, you know, because um, rosters are, are set up in certain ways where they might not be graduating a walk on for three years. There's no need for one. So it doesn't matter how good you are. They don't have a spot for you. Or, um, you know, being a walk on, a lot of it is like luck and it's also relationships. And there's a lot of walk ons around the country that got to where they are because, um, you know, their dad knew someone or their teammates with someone or, or, you know, or they met someone or whatever. And so it's really hard, you know, it, but, but don't ever give up on, on, on that dream, you know, and, and work your butt off so that when your number is called or when you are approached or you got to always pretend like whenever you're playing or working out, you know, the coach is watching you because you're trying to make that good first impression. I think that's exactly it, Joey. I think you have to be prepared at all times. And I think you have to just eliminate your ego altogether and, and not say like, like, I, you know, I think it'd be easy if, if maybe they, they pass over you your freshman year and you're seeing a walk on that's on the team and you're like, I'm better than that guy. How am I not get, get rid of those thoughts just be, cause I think all of us were very, very lucky. And, um, that really sucks to, to hear that, to be like, man, so I just have to be lucky. Is that the best way? I, but, but I, I think the flip side of that is though, you have to prepare yourself for that opportunity. So when it comes, um, when, when luck does strike, you're ready for it, you know? And, uh, I think, I think just like Joey said, just like play working on your game. Um, keep, keep in contact with the coaches, I guess. Dave Egelhoff, that's your answer. Just bother Dave <laughs> Egelhoff. And tell me, you know, talk to Eagle. And talk to Eagle. Um, but no, I mean, eventually there's going to come, there's going to come a point where they'll want to watch you play or they'll, they'll be like, okay, we need you. Like, it'll be like, like, like my, like I was lucky, but if I wasn't in the position I was in when Ron Lewis turned his ankle, and I, you know, at that point I had, I had completely quit or like, I don't know if I had left Ohio state and transferred, whatever I'd given up on. Um, I would never have made the team. And, and uh, I, I think that's it. Just prepare yourself, uh, have no ego about it. And um, cause that's going to suit you well for when you, if you do get the opportunity, you're not going to want to have an ego at all because uh, they will beat that out of you very quickly. <laughs> if any part of you thinks that you matter, like as a basketball player, you definitely do not. So it's best to just, <laughs> have that attitude going in <laughs> so this is you know we're, we're just about at the end but I do want to give one I think there's a question here that's so important which is you know we have a lot of people a lot of kids that are ending their high school careers in a way that they did not plan to and they're isolated and they're feeling like you know this is you know after all these years this isn't how they thought it was going to end we could say the same thing about a lot of people who are leaving college too you know, you guys are so upbeat. You've brought so much joy to so many people. And I know this feels like a lot of responsibility to put this on you, but if you could give a message to these people who are feeling like, you know, I, I'm really in a bad space right now. This is not how I thought things were going to end. I will. I, yeah, I, I'll, I will gladly take this one. Uh, so Danny, Danny mentioned it, that like you, you learn these lessons when you're a walk on that, that, that you apply to your life later and, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I will say that the darkest moments of my life, the, some of the worst, and I've had more adversity than I've made public. And I've, uh, you know, I've been through some, some bad times, certainly. Um, all of that stuff is stuff that I draw on every single day. It's stuff that has made me who I am today. I am like, like, I, I absolutely love it. And I think, I think like you, one of the, one of the things that sucks about being younger is you have older people tell you that you hear these things that like, uh, this is an opportunity to turn this into a positive and all that stuff. And you just kind of have to live life and you start to realize that. And so I would say, if you are someone in high school that kind of had like the, what should have been like a cool little stretch of your life taken from you, um, you're kind of getting a head start. I mean, like, honestly, you're, you're, you're being faced with this sort of adversity is going to help you so much more than you realize in your life. And you will draw on it so much more than you realize. And I'm just some old dude telling you that. And I realize that uh, it's going to go in one ear and out the other with a lot of people. But um, I think you, you look at this as an opportunity to learn some lessons about how the world works. It kind of like, just resets your, your understanding of what's important to you in your life and where you want to take your life. And there will be a time where something will happen and you'll, you'll draw back on this and you'll be like, Hey man, listen, I know that this, you, you'll be mentoring somebody and you'll be like, I know this is, this sucks for you, but let me tell you about my experience when I went through this. Um, all of that, I'm a testament to it. I believe in it. Um, 
adversity really does build character and uh it's it's something no one wants to hear as they're going through adversity but uh someday you'll look back on it and be like i i actually learned a lot from that experience i think none of us could have said it any better so <laughs> With that, gentlemen, I cannot tell you how privileged we are to have spent this time with you. We are so grateful to you. Once again, uh, this is a production from the Sports and Society Initiative. Uh, we, heard, we encourage you to visit us at sportsandsociety.osu.edu. Every Thursday, we're here with um, experts in their field, people who can share stories that we don't get um, the opportunity to ask under other circumstances. So next week, we're going to welcome the voice of the Columbus Blue Jackets. We have Bob McGilligan, Jean-Luc Grandpierre, and Jeff Svoboda, an alum of our program, who's going to join us. Uh, this coming Tuesday, we're also going to continue our look at name, image, and likeness. So I hope that you'll join us this Tuesday and next Tuesday to tackle both of those. This week, we have terrific guests. We have Renee Montgomery from the WNBA, and now uh, we're talking to uh, someone from Gatorade. So this is going to be an exciting time to explore a topic that's pretty confusing for all of us. But please join me in thanking Joey Lane, Danny Hummer, and Mark Titus for an amazing hour. Gentlemen, I am just honored to spend this with you, and I hope that we get to see you again on Columbus campus very soon. Thank you.